uh, and urge them to take action. Um, we urge you to take a few minutes to do this now as we transition to our closing keynote speaker. Uh, we are absolutely thrilled to welcome Max Joseph as our closing keynote speaker. Um, Max is an amazing writer, an artist based in London who has written extensively on Assyrian issues over the last decade. Max, we are so incredibly honored to have you with us today to close out our program. So thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, Shalom Alokhan. Um, given I've been strategically placed, <clears throat> I think as a bridge between these two days, themed around providing information and guiding action, I'll try my best to represent that. Um, I want to provide another maybe bleaker, but definitely clear-eyed perspective on what has been discussed today. And the speakers have been all incredible. Um, I want to first talk about a bit about the KRG, then about Iraq, and finally about Assyrians more broadly. In the context of providing information to political representatives, journalists, and analysts, it's very easy to sit here and criticize the KRG or an entity that most Assyrians in Iraq are now governed by, because the list of failures is long, and in most cases known but not publicly acknowledged. This is the Despite the ever-expanding trade, support, and funding to the tune of billions of dollars and pounds and dinars and euros and rubles and rupees and yen, all since 2003, yet the salient point for me is that the KRG still doesn't really exist. Political representation, representatives, journalists, and analysts keep talking about a single entity, a single structure, and I dare I say sometimes even as having a single purpose, when everything inside the KRG is split along extremely partisan lines, as already been discussed here. There is no government. There are two dominant political parties with their own administrative structures, their own bureaucracies, their armies. There is no Peshmerga, so to speak. There is KDP militias and there are PUK militias. And in an even more granular sense, there are individual commanders in their own loyal units. There is no budget. There are salaries, pensions, and, benef and the benefits split between tribal factions who have bargained with each other for them. There is no law enforcement. There is Wasta, nepotism, dynasty, and the arbitrary arrest of ordinary citizens. And finally, there is no real economy. There is only cash flow to these dynasty figures and their followers, as well as the local conglomerates, which serve as the business arms of these parties. And they have monopolies over energy, construction, and everything else in the region. Uh, this is all alongside a burgeoning black market that ordinary people partake in. In a way, I think people are still trying to talk it into being and write it into being and fund it into being as one coherent entity, but the prospect of a democratic region for all is actually becoming increasingly remote as the dominant parties are only consolidating their power with this support and not decentralizing it. This is an ongoing failure. It must be said these conditions are endured by everyone who lives under KRG authority. But I want to create a distinction here. I don't think it's enough to say Assyrians are at the margins of this kind of society, as per the title of a previous panel today. Legislatively, politically, demographically, we are instead invisible because only fragments of us are acknowledged, not the whole. Our faith, which is viewed monolithically as Christian, something of a pseudo unifier in the context of Iraq, perpetuates the Ottoman millet system, where differential religious leaders are positioned as political spokespeople for all non-Muslim communities. Our language too, referred to as Aramaic, which is technically a whole family of ancient languages, mostly locked into antiquity. This obscures the real living particular, Assyrian Aramaic or Syriac Aramaic, as academics may call it or our material heritage, which lies rotting across the country or confined to museums and galleries as glimpses into a bygone era shed by all, not as linkages to any still existing people. These conditions were created for us in our homeland by the states which formed from the ashes of the empires that fell 
after the First World War. And these conditions have been gradually exported to our adoptive states in diaspora, where, which interprets us largely through the limited prism of our own persecution, which is to say a people who are othered in their own homeland. In the context of the Kurdistan region of Iraq, its highest offices will publish English, English language videos promoting diversity, inclusion and tolerance under their watch. While in reality, the authorities routinely detain, threaten, sometimes even murder journalists and political dissidents. In the context of Iraq more broadly, you have to mention the fact that Kurds, Assyrians, Yazidis are all minorities demographically. But Kurds are a privileged minority constitutionally and in real terms, whereas Assyrians and Yazidis and others are disenfranchised minorities. We see this and we see why throughout history. And again, I don't want to spend too much time on these facts, but it's worth mentioning them. When thousands of Assyrians were massacred by the Iraqi army and Kurdish tribesmen in Semele, northern Iraq in 1933, it was under the pretense that we were troublemakers or foreign agents. This is despite the fact that Assyrians, unlike local Kurds or Arabs at the time, were the only group in Iraq to not have mounted any kind of armed insurrection against the colonial authorities, both Arab or British. When the US invaded Iraq in 2003 and, and ordered all local militias who, helped, who had helped end Saddam's regime to disarm, Assyrians believing in a brighter, more inclusive future for themselves inside Iraq after fighting for one so long, were one of the only groups to follow the directive, while Kurdish and Arab groups only grew their stockpiles. And most recently, when ISIS swept through northern Iraq in 2014, resulting, as we know, in the Peshmerga and the Iraqi army fleeing north and south respectively without a fight, it was only the Assyrians who had been arguing for a full decade prior, both inside Iraq and in diaspora, that local security should have been created and supported and that local administration should be empowered to deal with these issues and threats. So we see Assyrians have abided by the laws and decrees of the day and promoted inclusive policies, but we are always the ones most punished for it. This isn't some kind of romantic ex exceptionalism I'm trying to create here. I've outlined three pivotal moments throughout Iraq's history, and after each of them, we emerged far worse off than our neighbors. This set new brutal precedents as to how the state can and should deal with communities outside of their own self-defined political mainstream. Now, this is the relationship Iraq has created and reinforced over and over again between the citizen and the state. In one of the most candid interviews I remember reading, an Iraqi Arab government official plainly stated it in 2016, quote, everybody is corrupt from top to bottom including me. <laughs> he went on, I was offered $5 million by someone to stop investigating him because he was part of the anti-corruption committee. He said, I took it and continued prosecuting him anyway. Later on in an interview, he said, when people here steal, they steal openly. They brag about it. It's worth pointing out here that according to OEC figures, I don't know, this is just a fun fact for me. Jewelry makes up 5.2% in terms of dollar value of all imports into Iraq, 5.2%. And medical supplies make up 2%. This is a state that knows it's sick, but shows off its sickness. In a society like this, the weak are punished for their weaknesses, and the strong and rich and beautify themselves without needing any filters. These injustices are not typified by clandestine off-radar criminal operations, but representative of a brand of justice that has been incubated inside the country. Iraq is currently a place where crime is institutionalized at the heart of the revolving door of government, where the same names and families play musical chairs with powerful positions. I would argue this began with the inception of the state itself, this colonial collaboration between British and Arab elites, which metastasized into the modern picture today. As you've seen, a, a patchwork of warring militias and their foreign sponsors. The state has never corrected its tendencies to eat itself and all of its people, its natural resources and its diverse cultures from the inside out 
and as fast as permissible. Whether it's Baathism or Kurdish nationalism or religious extremism, sectarianism or gangsterism, all chapters in the story of Iraq, it is the vulnerable and minoritized who suffer the most because they are not only demand a better deal, they demand a better system. Is Syrians are already a broken people after the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire. We argued for a contiguous homeland spanning from Mosul all the way to Hakkari in modern day Turkey, where we could administer our own affairs and regain a sense of security and dignity. But this was denied to us. Our demands now grow smaller and smaller with each new round of violence and exile. We continue to repeat these demands to the international community but we are told these demands grow less compelling, less feasible, less realistic with each new generation of Assyrians who make them. There is a strong positive correlation here between how great the sympathy is Assyrians receive from various government officials and how little they believe we can achieve on them. Here the officials who provide the most positive rhetoric are doing so because they know just how much is being taken from us in return. No elites, whether it's from the East or the West, sat down sympathetically with Assyrian generals a century ago and then released statements promoting inclusion and diversity. Because these statements are those of mercy to the defeated, not expressions of understanding, respect or desire for genuine partnership. And mercy should not be our stealing. This is politics of gesture, of tokenism, as has been discussed already today, and increasingly characterizes our modern experience and represents a large part of the optics we are expected to enjoy and appreciate. But Assyrians demand the most frightening thing of all in the rock, indigenous, indigenous rights, and through that, quite perversely, equality. It is frightening because larger groups agitate for privilege, convince their proxies to do the same or want a mere reordering of the same oppressive hierarchy in their favor. Calling for equality disrupts the very fabric of Iraq, the essence of it. For the international community, equality presents a new scenario it cannot quite digest. Western governments who agonize over the failures of their policies in Iraq do so because nobody knows what a positive settlement would actually look like or how it can come about. Instead, the status quo becomes repackaged and remarketed to all while hoping for a different result. And what do they say about doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result? The truth is, as with any arduous political transformation, change is less exciting and more gradual than we want it to be. Unfortunately for short-term political reps, and, and their appointees, there is no sustainable get rich, get rich quick scheme in politics. Our election cycles do not allow for it. Despite the rush to boast about discovering them, whether it's the formal partition of Iraq or divorce from Baghdad, as Nasr Barzani wrote in the Washington Post before the Kurdish independence referendum in 2017, or the resurrected Biden plan, let's call it 2.0, which legislates for a doomed federalist structure along ethno-sectarian lines, the Sunni Arab, the Shia Arab, and the Kurdish regions, respectively, while signaling the full erasure of indigenous communities outside of this imagined triumvirate. Iraq, while incredibly dysfunctional, is also very stubborn to such all-encompassing change but not because of an enduring sense of patriotism shared across the country, as many optimists may propose, but because these changes would profoundly disrupt the thoroughly networked patronage systems of the entrenched elite. Recently, however, we've seen these protests that rocked the country last year. We can see some kind of broader consciousness shift, a positive one, but it remains to be seen where this goes post COVID-19. Since Iraq is an oil economy, it's important to point out that lawmakers control 94% of Iraq's revenue through the sale of crude oil. And I want to talk about a little bit about the economy now, very briefly. In contrast to this, income tax revenue as a percentage of GDP in Iraq is 2%. This is important because this effectively makes elites in Iraq 
primarily beholden to foreign buyers who are looking for a good price in exchange for favors and a receding paper trail. In accountancy firm Deloitte's recent auditing of the KRG at the invitation of the KRG, it refers to spending from a budget. And as I said, there is no budget. No budget has been passed for years. Reportage like this from a very serious multinational accountancy firm would not fly anywhere else in the world. Whereas in Western societies, the contract between government and citizen is maintained for a relatively progressive taxation system. This is the source of government in revenue usually. So with this dynamic, the Iraqi state has never been truly accountable to the Iraqi public. Feeding into this widespread, always growing cynicism and take what you can get attitude inside the country. Uh, but as I said, slowly, maybe this will change. The state generates its own revenue, though, almost independent of public participation, if effectively in this extinguishing any prospect of a transparent and fair economy. This creates these patronage systems or the expectation of a government salary for whatever labor or none in return for loyalty. This creates lords and peasants, not public servants and citizens. Um, Iraqi analyst uh, Harif Hassan, I want to quote him briefly from April 2019. He put it really well and very succinctly. He wrote, the, the rentier nature of the Iraqi state with oil revenues entrenching factional politics that revolve around distribution of spoils rather than competition among ideologies and political programs. Note the word spoils there. Iraq's wealth has never belonged to Iraqis. It is rather something that is won through scheming and force and then divided completely among the winners. And this strikes at the heart of where Syrians find themselves now in Iraq, amid oppressive patronage systems, bickering warlords, sectarianism, and an information gap that, that is papered over by Western governments, NGOs, and the bigotry of low expectations. Efforts to diminish us with these limited definitions mentioned previously, like Christian or Aramaic speaking, are often paired with utilizing us as props to further the, agenda, the agendas of larger, more dominant factions who deploy them. The KDP has historically co-opted individual Assyrians to temporarily boost their own interests, that again has been mentioned throughout the day, or praise their record on tolerance or restitution and justice for our people and others as a whole, when all evidence points to the contrary. This can be seen most recently, for example, with the rise of Chaldean Archbishop of Arabil, Bashar Warda, a man who is on record calling for his parishioners to not join any quote-unquote Christian militias, with the implication that this included the MPU, and, enjoy, and joined the Peshmerga or Iraqi army instead. He climbed the political ladder so quickly in doing so, he was invited to the White House to legitimize this flawed framework of international religious freedom legislated by the now outgoing US administration in 2018. When all it has done is strengthen sectarianism within our own community, disempower us by allocating prestige and influence to unaccountable clerical figures and faith-based organizations, who are concerned with only parts of our community and not the whole, and bypass any serious partnership opportunities with representatives who are actually accountable to our community. Now, I want to say here at this juncture, if the API didn't exist, there would be almost no evidence based and codified record of why the NPU is so important, or of how our representation was mostly stolen during the last election in Iraq or the KRG, and what the security picture is like in the Ninwe Plain means for the people who actually live there. Because while the conflict of ISIS has wound down, the information gaps that I mentioned are actually widening. Both Assyrians and non-Assyrians would be ignorant about these events, as well as the repeated attempts to undermine our voices and antagonize our political programs and objectives. And as we have seen through Iraq's history, 
this ignorance has only thrown the country as a whole deeper into ruin and turmoil. But where does this leave the international community in regards to our issues then? I mean, we can see exactly where, given the recent conflict in Artsakh, for example, or Nagorno-Karabakh. First, for any Armenians on the call, I want to extend my sympathies to you. Watching Armenians say goodbye to their ancestral lands, burn their own properties to mark their departure was unspeakable, tragic. But ultimately, a political decision that was engineered by members of this international community and forced onto a cornered Armenian executive. If Syrians as well as Yazidis in Armenia fought and died alongside you, and we are all let down again. For Assyrians, there is a major lesson here. I want to repeat what I had written recently. The sovereign democratic state of Armenia, with its diaspora, with its global advocacy base, multi-billion dollar economy, trade links, a professional army, celebrity power, the ability to raise millions of dollars overnight, couldn't leverage enough support from any world power, near or far, to protect a tiny piece of land almost fully populated by Armenians in presently and in the past from the advance of two forces deploy deployed by two despots and their autocracies. Assyrians should be under no illusion that any US administration or any other power will save us or help us prosper in our homeland as we are minority absent all of the above, which Armenians have collectively developed over the last century, continue to beg at the feet of our adoptive states for scraps of aid and acknowledgement and sing and dance about the systems, both in the East and West, which leg legitimize and perpetuate our oppression. I wanted to, to emphasize this point here because it's an important one. It's Syrians who believe we need to develop some kind of unified executive base or central authority in order to properly negotiate a settlement are living in denial. The evidence is not only in front of you for our own history, it's in the here and now. So what do we do? And briefly on this as well, everything I've said today is meant to make you more aware of the information gaps the perspective gaps, in order to provoke a response for you to try and fill them. We are not only losing our lands and having our identity stripped and auctioned off, we are losing the battle to speak our truth and build our own narrative, alongside others as equals. Telling our story is an act of resistance against this, and the more we rely on others to tell it, the more we will be once again forced and locked into relationships defined by dependency and failure. We lost control over writing our own history and regaining this ability must be a priority for all of us. Because without an open channel to do this, we cannot even begin to understand what we must do to continue living and contributing as a distinct people with a distinct culture and language in the modern world. Make no mistake, this conflict regarding information had begun a long time ago whether it's Barzani-controlled media such as Bredau or Kurdistan24, referring to us as a component of a broader Kurdish identity, or Kurdish nationalists vandalizing Wikipedia pages about Assyrians and locking them into place that way, or Iraqi channels, which continue Saddam's Arabization campaign by denoting us as simply Christians, as reflected in our quota or Western journalists and analysts who see any of this on the first page of their Google search results and go with it. We are constantly put within conceptual schemes of the world formulated by others and on their terms. And this reflects power, a hierarchy that has only been created because of genocide and exile and continued persecution. We can even go way back to when Western Christians designated our Eastern faith as her a heretical interpretation of Christianity and began missionary activities with the aid of material incentives. They pit newly Catholicized the Syrians or Chaldeans as they were soon anointed by the Vatican versus quote unquote Nestorian Assyrians with bread, honey and the promise of protection in the far reaches of the Ottoman Empire. And our people and other disempowered groups 
continue to be incentivized or tricked or cajoled or forced or coerced to disassociate from each other up to the present day. But ultimately, all of these promises and guarantees are broken. Everything that's used to be entice us has been broken. Every single instance of our humiliation and destitution, every chapter of it began with a lie, but we will make it end with the truth. When I said earlier that transformational change within Iraq is more gradual, that applies to the Assyrian community too. A friend once said that we can, before we can liberate our lands, we must liberate our minds. And I agree with that. So I want us to incorporate everything we do involving Assyrians, involving our community, involving, you know, these things into a framework of self-help, which promotes values like sustainability, accountability, and transparency. We don't even know how many of us there are in the world and what we have in our national toolkit. This toolkit is a hypothesized economy. If we are Assyrians, we should demonstrate that in real terms by building effective organizations, creating real and online spaces for free expression, funding bodies to help bring projects to life, networking spaces, and so on. The list is very long. But we're still mostly having that same League of Nations conversation over and over again because each new generation in diaspora especially is taught to believe in the virtues of the systems they have been raised within and the justice it can deliver, it can be trusted to deliver. And this is so deeply ingrained of us psychologically and innocently has to be said, whether you're on the left or right of the political spectrum. The key is you can often rely on this justice to be delivered to you as an American Assyrian or a British Assyrian or a Swedish Assyrian or whatever. But this justice does not get on the plane to Iraq and show up outside Afra's door in Alkosh. Instead, it shows up and smiles in photos of those who are oppressing him and others in Alkosh. So I want to end by saying the desire of Assyrians to restore a sense of rootedness and dignity to achieve equality, enjoy prosperity in our homelands will continue wherever Assyrians live. This desire along with our trauma is, collect is the, the trauma that we collectively endure is intergenerational, will not wane. It will only become more refined, more focused into precise and effective actions. We have to remind everyone and ourselves that we are more than what they say we are, what they write we are, and so on. We are being written out of history, but we can pick up the pen and write ourselves back in. I want people to remember that before they accept inferior inferiority and indulge in defeatism about the future. There are many people who are working to achieve great things for our community, and you've heard from some of them already today, but you'll hear from more of them tomorrow. And we're always making friends too. Maybe, you know, maybe not me all the time, but <laughs> I imagine a lot of other people are. But lastly, I want to say lasting change does not reliably come about from single, single monumental moments, but a series of smaller moments that which reinforce each other. Thank you all for having me gonna go ahead and echo that sentiment. Um, super powerful way to end that live session today. Thank you so much, Max, um, for the incredible moving words and for all that you do to help bring greater awareness to these issues. Um, this brings us to the end of our scheduled program for today. Uh, we, we have without a doubt taken in a lot of information um, and yet we recognize that there are so many other issues and voices that deserve to be heard. Uh, we encourage you to take the time to reflect on everything you've learned today and to continue these discussions online and amongst your circles, social media, what have you. Uh, we look forward to applying what we learned today to our discussions tomorrow. Day two of our conference will be focused on action and how we can show up as and for Assyrians. Tomorrow's live sessions will begin at 11 a.m. Eastern time. We hope you'll consider joining us again to hear from community leaders from across the globe on strengthening Assyrian organizing and activism. We also have an interactive workshop led by Amanda Slefo, uh, which will explore Assyrian collective memory, cultural identity, and what it means to be an Assyrian in today's world. 
use of participant video for tomorrow's sessions is optional, but encouraged, definitely encouraged. In the meantime, we urge you to check out some of the on-demand content to be sure to visit our virtual exhibitor hall and keep these conversations going on our discussion board. Check out some of our pre-recorded presentations to learn more about issues affecting Assyrians across the Middle East. Our on-demand content, again, will be accessible uh, throughout this weekend. We hope you found today's sessions informative, enjoyable. We'd love to hear from you on social media, so please give us a tag um, and use that official um, hashtag. It's, it's API Conference 2020. Thank you so much again for being here. We look forward to welcoming you back tomorrow and hear from you on ways to strengthen Assyrian activism worldwide.